people. <laughs> I started getting cranky and things frustrate me. Oh, you fans calling me, that kind of stuff. When I leave them alone all year, Amen. and then all of a sudden they decide to pester me, Amen. that kind of stuff, you know, starts making me frustrated. <laughs> I'm teasing. You guys know I love you. Amen. I wanted to call so many of you when Ohio State mops the floor with OU, though. I really wanted to so bad, but I just left you alone. You couldn't leave me alone yesterday, though, but I still love you, and I'm still going to preach this morning. <laughs> Amen. Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to leave the Sun Nature series this morning because I'm going to do so at the, uh, at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He woke me up in the middle of the night last night, and he does that to me a lot. Now, I will say this. Mark Shell said something when he was ministering. He said, you know, if you're up praying in the middle of the night over things, it's because you're not resting. You're not leaving it in his hands and resting. Now, I agree with that. I don't ever get up and pray in the middle of the night. I, get, that's, I got plenty of daylight for that. But I do get up and listen in the middle of the night. There's a difference. Amen. I get up and listen regularly. A lot of times he speaks to me and it starts in my dreams. And I'll have dreams. I'll wake up from the dreams. He was speaking to me subconsciously in a dream. I'll wake up and I'll hear him still saying what he was telling me when I was in a dream. That happens to me all the time. I don't know if all of you can relate to that. But I'll wake up and I'll hear him talking. He will have been talking to me subconsciously. I'll wake up and I'll hear him consciously finish the sentence that he was in the middle of. And those times are so powerful for me that I get my phone and move over to my recliner. And I sit there and just take notes. I jot down everything that he's saying. Last night, well, really, the last two weeks have been those kind of weeks. I've been dreaming a lot, and a lot of it has to do with the direction of Grace Center, of, of our destiny, our prophetic destiny, but also mine and Stacy's, you know, just things that he's been do, doing in us and through us, through our family unit. Last night was one of those nights, and I wondered what was going on because yesterday he had me reading Genesis 37, the story of Joseph. I was just drawn to it, and I know how to follow that. I know how to learn how to follow that flow. So um, you pre get up and preach. Ignore that prompting one time and go ahead and get up and preach what you wanted to. You'll never do it again. <laughs> yeah, Amen. How many preachers in the house know what I'm talking about? Amen. Because all of a sudden you're on an island, and it doesn't feel like you're anointed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Genesis 37, verse 1. Let's do some reading together, and let's take this 37th chapter in, all of it, uh, just to brush up. I don't know how long it's been since you heard this story or read this story, but let's go through and get it fresh in your memory, and then we'll talk about it. Verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives or concubines. And he brought a bad report about them to their father. Somebody say tattletale. Tattletale. But I'm going to show you in a minute why he did that, okay? Now, Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age. And he made a robe or a coat of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. You ever met anyone like that? <laughs> that you just couldn't bring yourself to speak peaceably to? That's why you got to love the honesty of kids. <laughs> they don't understand rhetorical questions, do they? <laughs> then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheaf stood up and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. Verse 8, are you really going to reign over us, his brothers asked him? Are you really going to rule us? They began to immediately discern the dream. They interpreted it. They knew what it meant right there on the spot. They understood the, the symbolism. And uh, so it said that they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers, but his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you have had? He said, are your mother and brothers and I going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. 
His brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, your brothers, you know, are pasturing the flocks at Shechem. Get ready, I'm sending you to them. I'm ready, Joseph replied. Then Israel said to him, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. So there it was. Joseph was the trusted son of Israel, his father. Yeah. So the other ones would get out into nonsense and foolishness and not tend the father's business and the flocks right. So Joseph was the one he had already known, begun to know he had, he had his favor, he had his trust. So that's why he's sending him out to bring reports back. Okay? It's not just that he's a tattletale for the sake of being ornery. He's on his father's business. <clears throat> okay? That, you still don't like him anymore, do you? <laughs> Then Israel, okay. A man found him there wandering in the field and asked him, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph said. Can you tell me where they are pasturing their flocks? They've moved on from here, the man said. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph set out after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Now they saw him in the distance. Before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a wild animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, don't shed blood. Throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, intending to come back and rescue him from their hands and return him to his father. But when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off his robe, the robe of many colors that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to a meal. These are some cold-hearted guys. <laughs> they looked up and there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying uh, aromatic gum, balsam, and resin going down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And they agreed. When Midianite traders passed by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy is gone. What am I going to do? So they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a young goat, and dipped the robe in its blood. They sent the robe of many colors to their father and said, We found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? His father recognized it. It is my son's robe, he said. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will go down to Sheol to my son mourning. And his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guard. Okay, I want to just share some things that I have on my heart today. It's going to be a little bit of a prophetic message because I usually have uh, usually have outlines that I follow and no notes and points, but instead I just have a bunch of things that the Holy Spirit spoke to me last night. And uh, so I wrote all of them down, and I'm going to try and uh, navigate my way from point to point because he gave me points to make. I've heard the word pit before used as an acronym in the story of Joseph, prophet in training. You ever heard that before? Very true, prophet in training. But for the sake of today's message, I want to use a different acronym for you. I want to focus on purpose invading time. Amen. Purpose invading time. Because that's the acronym I feel like the Holy Spirit brought out to me this morning. Purpose invading time. Come on, brother. Now, before we dive deep into the story, I want to just highlight a couple of things here. Uh, when you go back up to the first few verses, it talks about Joseph having a coat of many colors that his father made for him. One of the interesting things is that Hebrew word for made is the word asah, A-S-A-H, asah, and it doesn't mean made, made just one time. So this is interesting. And it took some time to research this morning, and it literally means in the Hebrew language to continue to make or to consecutively make over and over again. So you're probably wondering, well, why would he do that? Well, do you remember the story in 1 Samuel chapter 1 when Hannah and Elkanah had been praying for a son and they finally had Samuel? 
Uh, and she dedicated Samuel to the Lord, to the priest of the Lord, to be raised by Eli. So they took him to the temple and they left him with the priesthood to be raised of the Lord. But in 1 Samuel chapter 1, it said, it goes on to say that Hannah visited her son every year and brought a new fresh linen ephod for him to wear. Because he was growing mm -hmm. yeah. from year to year. Yeah. So every year he would grow, so she would show up with another one he could wear that year. So that's what's going on here. This wasn't just a coat that Jacob or Israel had made for his son, but it was an annual thing he was doing for him. The boy was growing every year. At the time we picked the story up in chapter, chapter 37, verse 1, Joseph is 17 years old now. So this is something his father had kept doing for him consistently and continually. So we'll, and we'll get into the why of that here in just a second. Now that's what most Hebrew scholars agree on. Now you don't have to agree with me and it's okay, <clears throat> but most Hebrew scholars agree that that's what's being said here about this coat of many colors is that Jacob made him a new one every year to accommodate for the growth as he grew, okay? And here's why. You have to understand Jacob was 90 years old by the time Joseph comes along. He had been married to Rachel for a long time. It was his first love. Now, he had multiple wives because if you remember, he wanted Rachel. Laban tricked him, though, and gave him Leah first. So he, he went ahead and worked longer for Rachel. And, uh, and so the, he, he eventually began to have sons with Leah, but Rachel was barren. Do you remember that? From the story, if you go back, I'm giving you some, some children's church stuff here. If you've not been back into some of these stories and gotten a hold of them in a while, I'm just refreshing your memory. So uh, Leah and, uh, and the concubines began to produce sons for Jacob and daughters as well. But, the, but, but Rachel is barren and she is moaning and crying and praying for sons, but she can't have any. So for 21 years, she's unable. She's barren and unable to give Jacob any children. So when her womb finally opens up, the first time Joseph is the one born. Amen. So that's why he's got some significance, Joseph does, to his father. Amen. For that, for, for multiple reasons, okay? Uh, first of all, Jacob was a man who was very keenly tuned in and aware to the spirit realm, the supernatural realm. Yeah, this is the guy who had dreams of ladders coming to him from heaven, who who caught God and wrestled with him, okay? So this, he's used to supernatural experiences. So Joseph is born. Now, he's already had many years watching these other sons grow up, okay? There's these sons that threw him into the pit to sell him off into slavery. These were men, okay? They, they were grown men by the time Joseph comes along. They're having kids of their own. So Joseph and, and Benjamin are the last two, but he does, and Benjamin is actually the last one the youngest son, but he doesn't call Benjamin the son of my old age. He calls Joseph the son of my old age. There's something that he discerns and detects about this son, okay? So Benjamin came from Rachel as well, but Benjamin, he has a role later. He's not tied into this story here, but the, the, the reason why is the family's prophetic destiny is tied to this man, Joseph. So Jacob intentionally chooses to put his favor on Joseph and call him the son of his old age. Now, he puts a coat on him. Everybody say, puts a coat on him. <laughs> now I want you to think back to the story of Jacob. The reason why he puts the coat on him representing his favor, the father's favor, the blessing of the father, the recognition that there's prophetic purpose and destiny there. That's how Jacob in had, had to access his father's blessing was by putting on a coat. But he put on a coat of hair because he went into his father, Isaac, who was on his deathbed, and he wanted to give the, the blessing of the firstborn. Now, now, he wasn't the firstborn. You remember the story? It's a pretty interesting story. When Jacob and, when, when Rebecca is pregnant with Jacob and Esau, she uh, is, is there feeling turmoil and fighting and warring going on. And she goes to inquire the Lord, and the Lord says, there are two nations warring within you. Two sons and their two nations warring within you, okay? So he said, that's what's going on. It's in Genesis 25. Uh, and so uh, she conceives and she has these children. And well, here, listen to what the word says about, about this. When she asked the Lord, what's going on inside of me? The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One will be stronger than the other. And get this, the older will serve the younger. 
Okay, so when her time came to give birth, there were indeed twins in her womb. The first came out red looking, covered with hair like a fur coat. And they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand. So he came out right behind Esau, but he had his hand on his brother's heel, holding on to him. So that's really what the word Jacob means. It means heel grasper. Okay, so as the boys grew up, Esau ends up selling his birthright to his brother Jacob. You remember the story? He comes in from hunting one day. I could get into a lot more detail, but Esau, he grows up, he becomes a, a, a hunter, a man who spends all of his time outdoors, but he also is a wild-natured man. He's a man who pursues his lusts and his passions and is not mindful of his purpose, his prophetic purpose at all. It doesn't seem to matter that much to him. How do I know that? Well, it's pretty obvious because he comes in famished from a hunting trip and he says he's starving to death and about to die. And he asks Jacob to make him one of his famous meals. And Jacob says, I'll make it for you if you'll sell me your birthright. Now, I want you to know something, okay? What took place between them two? I did some research on this. Was a legal covenant recognized in that culture at that time. So Jacob wasn't conniving and tricking that out of Esau. He recognized the significance of it, the importance of it, and he wanted it. He wanted the, the, that blessing of the firstborn. He wanted the birthright. So Esau sells it to him. So they have a covenant agreement between them. Now fast forward. Later on, Isaac is about to die, and he calls Esau to him, and he's ready to give him the blessing of the firstborn. So Esau, even though he had already given up the right to that, to Jacob legally and covenantally, he's ready to take it anyway because he doesn't care. So he's going to go ahead and take it. So his father says, go out and, and, and kill some venison, bring it back and prepare it, and feed me a good meal, and then I'm going to speak the blessing over you, okay? So Esau goes out, and, and Rebekah overhears the conversation, and she says, Jacob, now understand this mother. You, you hear the story play out. And you think, man, this woman was vicious. No, this woman was prophetically minded to the purpose of her family moving forward, okay? As you might even say she was being led by the Spirit of God because she knew Esau was a man who just who cared more about his passions than he did his purpose. He was also a man who went out and married foreign women from idolatrous countries. And the Bible says that Esau's wives became a vexation to his parents. They began to vex his mother and father sorely. Okay, so she knows Esau is not on the path towards purpose. She knows that. Now, the, how many of you as parents understand there are tough decisions sometimes to make in life? As a parent, there's tough decisions to make. So she knows that Esau is not on the path towards purpose, but Jacob is. She recognizes, she remembers the promise, the older will serve the younger. So she takes that and she says, here's what we're going to do. You're go I'm going to fix this up the way your father likes it. You're going to take it into him and feed him because he is blind by this point. He can't see. And then he's going to bless you. He's going to give you that blessing of the firstborn. So he says, Mom, that sounds like a great plan. But if he touches me, he's going to know I'm Jacob because I'm smooth and my brother is hairy. So she takes the skins of a goat and puts them on his hands and arms. Esau must have been a hairy guy. <laughs> and, 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 and decks him out in this hair. And so he goes in and his father says, come closer to me. And when he embraces him, he smells the field. He smells the goat. Okay. <laughs> Smelled great too, didn't he? <laughs> and he eats the food. And he even says, the, the, it, you feel like Esau and you cook like Esau, but you talk like Jacob. He even says that. But nonetheless, he goes ahead and he speaks the blessing over them, okay? And listen to this blessing. I want you to listen to this. I'm still talking about Joseph, but I want you to understand why he was the favorite one of his father. Uh, let's see, what chapter would that be in? I think it's later on down. Well, let me just read. I'm not sure what chapter it is. I don't want to misquote you. May God give to you from the dew of the sky and from the richness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. Whoops, I just, there we go. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. Are you getting this? 
Those who curse you will be cursed, and those who bless you will be blessed. Then Isaac dies. Or, or he doesn't die until Esau comes in and realizes what's going on. And he says, Father, give me the blessing. And he said, I've already given it. I've already put it out. That can't be reversed. He said, don't you have a blessing left for me? And he gives them a little makeshift blessing, but he basically says, you're going to serve your brother from this day on. You're going to bow your knee to your brother. So Esau vows, I'll kill him. You know, that's what he says. But understand something. It's, he's at a point now where he's beginning to realize the desperation of what has just happened, but he had never cherished it from day one. It had never been valuable to him. It never meant anything to him. And it wasn't that Jacob tricked him out of it every step of the way. It's that he was willing to give it up to Jacob initially in a legal binding agreement that they had between the two of them. So in the same spirit of his mother, Rebecca, Jacob discerned that the previous sons that he had had were born to him, that they were born to him. They were more about their passion than they were their purpose. So he identifies this son of his old age. When Joseph comes on the scene, he's born from his first love, by the way, Rachel. And, and he identifies him and he says, this is the one who's going to be the dreamer of the family. This is the one who's going to carry the family to their destiny. Okay, <clears throat> so remember this, this Hebrew clan, this whole clan, which began with Abraham, okay? It began with one man, by the way. We, sometimes we forget that. We act like it's been a nation that was around since Eden. But it began with one man, and it came out as a covenant with that one man. Amen. So this Hebrew clan began with Abraham, and the whole clan had a history with prophetic dreams and angelic visitations. All of them did. Amen. Abraham did. That's how the Lord came to him and began to manifest to him prophetically and in dreams and visions and, and angelic visitations. Then Jacob comes along, or Isaac and Jacob both come along having dreams as well, having spiritual encounters the same way. Now Joseph comes, so it's in the family to have prophetic encounters, to dream dreams, okay? Dreams that come during the dark seasons of your life are what I heard Mark Sharona call one time invasions of hope. Whenever dreams come to you in the dark seasons of your life, there are invasions of hope into your life. Now, I thought that was pretty powerful. Uh, so all of these guys had a tendency, they, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the fathers of this company of people that would later become a nation, uh, they all had this tendency that when they fell into sound sleep, then another force or power took over when they fell into sound sleep. Now, I could take off at that point and get into some things that Mark Shell was talking about when he was here. That's not really the intention of today's message, though. I want to tell you what goes on in your dreams, okay? In deep sleep, the body is basically paralyzed. In deep sleep, and the conscious mind, it's not conscious at that moment. Okay, so but another part of your mind kicks into gear and it's in that place where God begins to impart his will and his purpose. It's in that place that God begins to speak to you. Now, you might not be a dreamer, but this is what happens in many dreams. There are dreams that we just have that are the random makeups of memories and things like that that you've experienced. There's really no such thing as eating too late and that causing a dream. That's not scientifically proven at all. We, we like to talk about it, you know, but that's not, dreams don't come from that. But, I mean, your mind is really a very sophisticated computer system that has so many things firing in it at any one time that it's constantly pulling things up. Remember what Mark was saying? Well, uh, or was it Mark or Harold? Harold was saying that when things are pulling back up to your mind, it's basically your brain's way of asking you when you have something come back to the forefront of your mind that you haven't thought about in a while, your brain is asking you, are you ready to delete this or what do you want to do with it? Yeah, That's why the stuff keeps coming up. And so you have to make a choice to either meditate on it or delete it and get it, do away with it. Amen. So that was good stuff that Harold was talking about that night. So I don't pray at night, but I listen at night because I have discerned from a very young age that with me, the Lord talks to me at night. Uh, that's when he accesses my subconscious. The rest of me is shut down. I'm asleep and it begins to infuse me with hope and purpose. And many times he's giving detailed wisdom to me for my family. He's giving wisdom to me personally for the ministry or he's giving wisdom to me for the church. Okay. I am not one of these guys that makes every decision in my life based on all of the dreams that I have. 
But I've never had a dream yet that wasn't confirmation of something he already told me. It, it, every dream that I have fits into something he's already told me, something he's already showed me. Okay? And so, oftentimes the things that I dream about are very specific details. So there are times where I'm just laying there frozen, like I said a while ago, asleep, you know, not moving, not aware of the external world. And he is downloading to me and imparting things to me. And then all of a sudden I might, I, I had a dream two weeks ago. I was fast asleep. As soon as my head hit the pillow and I went into a dream and it wasn't in, at, at midnight, my nephew downstairs went out the back door and he slammed the door. Well, I sleep right above the downstairs door, back door. So as soon as he slammed the door, just like that, I was awake and I was looking around to see what was going on. But I had been dreaming a pretty powerful dream, three or four page dream. And uh, I typed it all out the next day. And uh, so I, I have laid down. I looked around to see what was going on. I figured out that he had went out the back door, you know, so uh, and he came back. He wasn't sneaking off. <laughs> And they, they, they stay up late and they mess around, let the dogs out, come and go, but this, you know, shut the door loud, things like that. So I laid down, go back to sleep. Just like that, I started dreaming right where I left off. So I know that that's God when that happens. I woke up a third time at three in the morning and I was awake for a little bit, typing out what I had just dreamed, went back to sleep. And I, the third time I started dreaming right where I left off again. And I dreamed from three to five, and I woke up that time and moved to the chair, and, and I started typing all of this stuff out that I was dreaming. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, okay? So what he was saying to me, you know, it was so significant in that dream. He was talking to me literally about the direction of Grace Center moving forward this next few months. I typed it out. I'm going to share it with all the leadership. Uh, I, I, I typed it out. I've been chewing on it now for a couple of weeks. And one of the dreams that he had, he told me, visit with Terry Bates and, and, and invite him to come in and help the church get its finances heading in the right direction. So I had that dream. Well, I thought, okay, that's awesome. I'm pretty sure Terry would do that. But I never called him. I never really acted on it. So a few weeks later, I dreamed it again. This time I woke up and I made myself a reminder, reach out to Pastor Terry. I reached out to Pastor Terry and he said, I'd love to. He said, I'll be glad to. This is what I do, Pastor Mark. <laughs> That's what he said. This is exactly what I do. So I've got an appointment with him this week. So the Lord does talk to me through that stuff, okay? Um, you might not think he talks to all of you that way, but the tendency or the propensity is there for him too. A lot of times it's just that you're unaware of it or you've never had anyone teach you about it, or it could be. That he's talking to you at night and you just don't know it yet. Right. It really could be. Elihu said in Job chapter 33, when he is talking to Job, it's a conversation I won't get into. But in one part of the conversation, he says this. He said, for God speaks once, even twice, yet no one notices. In a dream, a vision of the night, one hears God's voice. When deep sleep falls on men, while slumbering upon the bed. Then he opens the ears of men and seals instructions. Amen. That's what Elihu said, talking to Job. So the Lord definitely does deal with us and speak to us. So what I felt like the Lord told me today was before we dismiss this morning, he wants me to activate that in you. Amen. So I want to ask that uh, Jan and Nita to come up at the end of the service and pray with me. And, and even Andrew, if he has anything, come to him as well. We want to pray. And I, I said those three because those three are anointed to do that. They're anointed to activate prophetic things like that. So I, I feel like the reason why he interrupted that series uh, with this was because he wants to activate something in the Grace Center to prepare us for a supernatural year in 2017. Amen? I really feel it very strongly. So, <clears throat> listen to this. We dream because God has created dreams as a vehicle to bring balance to the soul, not only based on daily activities of life, but also because there are seasons where God wants to impact us with something that we're not capable of receiving at a conscious level. Hallelujah. It's one of the reasons why God gives us dreams is he wants to, imp there are seasons in our life where he wants to impact us with something that we're not capable of receiving at a conscious level 
because we're so easily distracted or we're too easily stressed. Yeah. Amen. Now let me touch on that for just a second. When you are too easily distracted yeah. and too easily distressed, then he can't impart to you the things that you need to navigate you through that season of your life right. because you're not hearing clearly the message that he's trying to get into you. Yeah. So that's one of the purposes of dreams is to paralyze you. <laughs> is to get you to lay down, to basically knock you out cold so that he can... And, and, and when I started studying this this morning, it was amazing how many men and women in Scripture, that particularly men that Scripture focused on. But in the New Covenant now, we know that there's no, neither male nor female, right? Amen. Amen. Ladies, that was your chance. <laughs> there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, right? It's just one new man now. We're all in Christ. So uh, that... That, that's very key. I, so I believe that he wants to talk to us through dreams and visions and spiritual encounters. And I also believe that not only just dreams, but there are times where I believe he wants to just, in, just manifest. Yeah. Just come in and manifest to you and share things with you. You say, well, we're, will I see him or will I hear him? Maybe both. I've, it's both has happened with me. There have been times I've seen him. There have been times I've felt him. There have been times I've heard him. Uh, so, you know, it, it just depends. And, and, and your personality comes into play. Your prophetic gift comes into play. And we all hear different. Andrew could get up and teach on that and talk about how we all hear things differently based on different functions and gifts that we have and what have you. But let me break that down for you, okay? During seasons of high stress and anxiety, we can't always recognize an interruption of hope because we struggle to believe God really is that good. I'll repeat that. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. During seasons of high stress and anxiety in our lives, we can't always recognize an interruption of hope because we struggle to believe God is that good. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. So when you're highly stressed and you're very anxious and nervous and worried about things, you're not going to be tuned in to receive the impartation you need to receive. So what he often will do to get through to you is put you out cold. <laughs> And visit you in the night hours and begin to make spiritual deposits in you. Amen. And I believe this. I believe that if I, if I were to ask how many of you, well, let's just ask. How many of you have never had dreams like I'm talking about? Raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed, please. If you've never had dreams like that. Okay, see those four or five people. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You do have dreams. Okay, so a lot of you do. How many of you, is it a frequent thing? Okay, so quite a few of you. But see, I'm convinced that he talks to all of us. And he reveals to all of us and he shares with all of us. We just don't all know it. We don't always know it. Sometimes if, you, if you've if you gone to, a like Mark Shell says, a church that's so constipated, they haven't had a movement in many years, you know, <laughs> uh, there may not be a flow, a prophetic flow in that house. And you're not really introduced to the, the things that the Holy Spirit is doing and saying. Uh, this is not that kind of house, though, okay? This is the kind of house where we're welcoming him into every service to interrupt whatever program or agenda we have that day and speak to us what he has on his heart. This is a corporate gathering. This is not the church. We're the church, but we meet here for corporate purposes. We come together. We do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We come together for specific reasons there are corporate things, corporate impartations. There are gifts that are stirred up. There, whenever we come together corporately, there is an anointing that flows corporately that is not there individually. There are strengths that flow from one member to the other when we come in a setting like this. There is, amen? Then you just thought it's just because I wanted you here every service. And I say, it's not, I do, but you have to understand why, okay? It's not, it's not about control. It's not with me anyway. It's not about control at all. It's about helping you get control <laughs> of your life. <laughs> Amen? All right, so I'm a son or a, or a daughter, ladies, so that means that we get to dream dreams. Amen? This is, uh, I read this in a book like a couple of weeks ago. God has covered us, and he is constantly clothing us, not just once, but for every season that we move through and for every chapter of our life. Uh, the book that I was reading was talking about various manifestations that appear, that come to us in different seasons. But I want to take that quote and tie it into what I'm talking about this morning. 
when Jacob recognizes what's going on with Joseph, he sees the favor there. He sees it because he remembers it was on his own life as well. He remembers the prophetic promise. Think with me what, what God spoke to Abraham. Abraham passed down to Isaac. But then God met Isaac as well. And he said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Yeah. So he had what, I, what Abraham had passed down to him. Then it was confirmed by meeting the God face to face that his daddy told him about. Yeah. Then Jacob comes along. And Isaac tells him what his father told him and what God told him. And Jacob has what they have. But then Jacob also meets God for himself, meets God individually. Now, there's a pattern emerging here, a pattern I'm trying to get to emerge. And that's where every one of us eventually we're going to encounter the God that our parent or our pastor tells us about. Okay, because it's not his divine will. It's not it's not his will and purpose that. Only a select few encounter God. Amen. It's, that's not the way that he set it up. That's not his intention. He wants every one of his children to encounter him, yeah. to experience him, to feel his love, to hear his voice, uh, to see his face, to have dreams, to see visions, to have angelic visitations. Those things are all for every one of us. Amen. There's not, you know, I have a lot of them. In my life, but I want you. I want to drive this point home. He doesn't love me more than he does anyone else. Amen. I have a lot of them in my life because at a very young age, my I started talking to my parents and started telling them I'm seeing things at night and I'm hearing things at night. And I don't know what to do about it, but it's honestly freaking me out. <laughs> you know, I was it, it, I was 10 years old when it started, and then by the time I was 12 years old, they were getting dramatic. And so, uh, at 12 years old, by the time I was 14 years old, Jesus came to me and asked me to pastor. I had a dramatic dream one night about uh, a bunch of sheep in my barn and ravenous wolves on the outside trying to get in and get at them. And he came, and the shepherd comes walking out of the woods towards me, and there's a ferocious storm blowing. And I could hear sheep bleeding, and I could hear, uh, uh, I could hear wolves in the background. And the shepherd comes out with a flock of sheep. And he comes up, and I'm out on the front porch of my farmhouse, and he says, can I keep my sheep in your barn? Will you watch over them for me? And when he, but when he took his cloak off, it was Jesus. Man, I'm telling you, I fell into those eyes. Age 14. Age of 14, I fell into those eyes, and it was the purest love that I've ever seen in my life. Still can't talk about it without breaking down. I mean, it was powerful. So I went and I opened my barn and all of the sheep came into the barn and then he, he said some things to me which I believe had to do with the call and the impartation he was placed on my life. Next thing I know, he's gone. But the sheep are still there and the wolves are on the outside. And so I began to care for the sheep. So I went to my mom and told her that and she looked at me and said, you're not going to want to hear this. Uh, you're called the pastor. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> that involves preaching and I'm not preaching. And so I denied that till I was 19. You know, and you guys have heard me tell that story. I was like, there's no way I'm preaching. No way I'm getting in front of people. I'm not going to do any of that nonsense. But the Lord began to talk to me at a very young age. So that's the only reason why now when he wakes me up in the middle of the night, I don't argue anymore. I don't fight with it anymore. I'm not confused anymore. This is something that's been going on in my life for a long time. So, but you'll get there. You'll get there, okay? Matter of fact, this is now my normal. When it becomes normal to you, it doesn't mean I take it for granted. I certainly don't. Last night, it was 2.30, the first time I woke up from a dream last night, and I moved, I felt him pulling me to go over to the chair and write some things, and I began to write them down, what he was sharing with me. Man, I'm telling you, it was an invasion of hope. It was an infusion of hope and clarity about some things that I've gone through, that Stacey and I have gone through this year. So it's good stuff. You don't ever get it. You're so used to it that you begin to take it for granted, but it becomes normal. I think that it's time for the supernatural to become normal in our lives. Amen? Amen. Normal Christianity, in other words. So when you're dreaming, you're asleep or you're paralyzed, you're powerless regarding the dream. Now, Joseph dreamed the dreams, but his brothers felt like the ones with the power. They're jealous of him. They hate him. They want him dead. Eventually, they sell him off to get him out of their, out of their sight. Now, let me touch on this one subject here. 
you, it takes a very special brother to be able to listen to your dream and actually remain supportive of you. <laughs> very special brother, okay? Most of the time, those that are around you cannot celebrate your success because they somehow believe it came at their expense. I'm just being honest with you, okay? Because we all want to succeed. We all want to do well. We all want to be accepted. We all want to, you know, I'm just using the phrase, the term, I know we're accepted, but we all want to be relevant and significant. So when somebody comes to us and we see an acceleration of favor on their life, it's, you know, it, only the mature can truly celebrate that. Just be honest, okay? Because you want it to be you. <laughs> and you want it to be your timing and your time now. And you want, you want to see the acceleration. And you want to feel the favor. And you want to feel the blessing. So when they come to you and you're seeing all of that on their life, it's hard to celebrate them until you become mature. When you become mature, then you'll celebrate with them because you love them. But not every brother can do that. There are some dreams that I have I don't tell you. There are some dreams that I have. There are some dreams I've had about my future that it would sound braggadocious if I stood up here and told you. I've seen the crowds that I'm going to preach to one of these days, and I've seen all the places around the world that I'm going to travel to, and I've seen the men that I'm going to be sitting at tables with. I've seen this for a number of years, but if I said all of those details all the time, what are you, you guys aren't going to be impressed with that. I mean, that's, you're going to think the same thing Joseph's brothers thought. You're going to think, well, who do you think you are? You know, but listen, his, it takes real maturity to celebrate who got elevated. Amen. There's your Facebook Amen. quote. Amen. It takes real maturity to celebrate what water who got elevates. Even his father struggled to understand it and he rebuked him for sharing it. <laughs> he rebuked him for sharing it. But like any good father, he kept the matter in mind. That's <laughs> what Jacob did. So he said he rebuked him. See, here's the thing. There, there, there's spiritual fathers are in our lives for reasons, and and mentors and, and good leaders are in our lives to tell us that we don't have to say everything we dream. We don't have to share everything that God shows us. Uh, there, it takes spiritual discernment. Now, Joseph. I don't know. The question was raised: Could Joseph have avoided the pitfalls? <laughs> that began to happen right after that had he not shot his mouth off in front of his brothers. I don't know. It's a possibility, but God would have made it happen somehow. Yeah. Uh, but they already hated the kid. Okay, yeah. <laughs> They really kind of already hated him because of his daddy's favor on, 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 on his life. So, so he takes the news of Joseph's death hard. Now, Joseph hadn't died, but he thought he did. The brothers go back and they say, here's what's left of his coat. An animal apparently got him, and he moans and wails and weeps, mourns for his son. Why? He, he saw destiny in the boy. He saw destiny. He saw prophetic destiny. How many of you have ever felt like what you had attached hope to has just slipped through your fingers? Now, it's about to get real in here right now. I mean, he was believing in a prophetic destiny for the whole family to come through Joseph. And they're telling him, the kid is dead. A wild animal has torn him. So he is grieving not only the loss of a son, but the loss of a destiny. The loss of a dream. The loss of a family of what he felt like was going to happen in the family through this young man. Okay? So the brothers were scared of the dream that... <laughs> They're scared of the dream that came by night, and they thought they had the power to stop it, but they would discover that the real power was with God, not with them. Right. So they thought they had the power to stop it, but God had the power to perform it, regardless of what they did. The power comes from the one who originates it. Amen? So when God originates a dream or a prophetic word, there's no power to stop it from coming to pass. <laughs> I want you to get that. When he originates a dream or a prophetic word or a promise or a prophecy, there is no power that can stop it from coming to pass. In fact, everything and everyone that attempts to come against it only succeeds in helping facilitate it. <laughs> you got to get that. You got to get that in your spirit. So whatever the promise is or the prophecy or the dream that he spoke to you, everything that you think has been coming against it will only help facilitate it. Because the harder they fought that kid, 
the more the will of God began to manifest in a greater clarity eventually came out of it. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that Joseph knew all along what was happening. That's nonsense. He, he couldn't have known all along. You know, he had his dreams, but the dreams he had were of dreams of grandeur. I mean, they're dreams of people bowing to him and worshiping him, and he's ruling and he's governing. Next thing you know, he's in a pit. Yeah. You know, he thinks he's being left for dead. Then they pull him out and do something even worse. They sell him into slavery. Yeah. So he ends up at Potiphar's house as a servant, where then not only does it, it, it gets even worse because... Potiphar's wife eyes him and says, hey, he's a good looking guy. So she comes on to him and he flees the house and, and she pulls his cloak off as he's leaving. And then she's mad because she's scorned. So when Potiphar comes home, she says, that servant boy attacked me today and tried to rape me. And when I yelled for help, he ran off and here's his coat. So all of a sudden now he's taken from Potiphar's house and thrown into prison. And it, but it's in the prison that things actually begin to take shape. Amen. All right, let me get this wrapped up. God took the one brother that he knew he could trust, and he elevated him to save the very family that was trying to kill him. Amen. Think about that. He took the one brother that he knew he could trust, and he lifted him up to save the boys who were trying to kill him. Yeah. Why? Because any promotion that came their way only served to help fulfill their passions. But when promotion came Joseph's way, he used it to fulfill his prophetic purpose. And it takes, uh, it takes God to see into the heart of men to be able to discern the difference. If you've dreamed a dream and then you found yourself betrayed, forsaken, abandoned, or attacked, then I'm telling you, be encouraged this morning. Because that means the Lord has chosen you and he's got you covered with favor, whether you're in a pit or whether you're in Potiphar's house or in the prison. Whatever it is that has come against you, he has chosen you. He has set his love on you and chosen you for a specific reason and purpose. Now, <clears throat> I want you to get this. If you can't perceive his favor in the pit or in the prison, then you're not ready to be promoted to the palace yet. You've got to be able to perceive his favor in every situation. Paul said it this way, I've learned in whatever state I am in to be content. <laughs> okay? And so you have, you have to be able to perceive his favor on your life still in the low places of your life. See, if you're still waiting on better days to decide that you're blessed and you're not ready for the promotion he asked for you yet. Yeah, man, you're just not ready yet for it. But if you know that you're blessed and you're highly favored, whether you're in the pit or whether you're in the prison, you begin to operate in your gift right where you're at instead of waiting for better opportunities. And when you do that, you don't have to look for better opportunities. They look for you. Opportunity looks for, it's attracted to the one who's operating in their purpose, not the one wallowing in their pain. Opportunity looks for people operating in their purpose. So whether you're in a pit or a prison or whatever, wherever you're at, whatever purpose is in you, let the Lord reveal it and release it and begin to active, activate it to the point where you begin to operate it in, in that now, in the reality and the now of that moment. Don't say, well, I will when things get better. I'm telling you, they'll get better when you begin to operate in it. When you begin to tap into the gift that's in you right now and see the favor of God right now in that situation, then things will change. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, despise not the day of small beginnings, does it not? Yeah. But does it also say, bemoan not the times of betrayal? Yeah. <laughs> or track not away from the time of trouble or dodge not the time of distress or forsake not the time of famine? Yeah. It doesn't say it in those words exactly. But it was in the story of Joseph, it was the betrayal of brothers that kick-started the birth of a dream. Amen. Amen. It was trouble and tragedy and temptation that brought him to a great, his greatest triumph in his life. Amen. It was a famine that pushed the family of Jacob out of the land they were in, into the fulfillment of their future. And then we see in Joseph's life that in times of personal distress, often uh, what emerges in times of personal distress is prophetic fulfillment, prophetic purpose. Yeah. Amen. So the difficult seasons of your life are, can become the greatest seasons of discovery. I'm telling you, Hallelujah. and this is experience, talking. I've learned more about myself in the hard times than I ever have the good times. Yeah. 
I have discovered more about who I was, what I was capable of, and what I was called to do in the trying, difficult times of my life than I ever did when everything was smooth sailing. That's really when prophetic purpose and destiny begins to surface and emerge from your life when you're really going through some hard times. And uh, distress often causes us to think that we cannot go into the next chapter, chapter of our life without those who were important to us in the previous chapter. Let me, let me touch on this for just a second. And hear Papa's heart in this. Okay, so This is one of the things he spoke to me last night very clearly. <clears throat> and you have to understand, this is difficult for me to say because of what I've watched my dad go through for two months now. Uh, but it's, we begin to think that we cannot go into the next chapter of our lives without the person who was significant to us in the previous chapter of our lives. I emphasize the word without. But the Lord, and you're not going to want to hear this, but what the Lord is saying, sometimes you cannot go into the next chapter because of those who were significant in the previous chapter of your life. And here's why. Their departure oftentimes unlocks your destiny. Come on. That's what Papa told me. Come on. There are many times where the departure of those who were vitally significant in this season of our life actually unlocks a destiny in us that had they not left would not have been activated and released yeah, that's, that's with the significance that he wants to activate it and release it. That's, yeah. wow. that's one of the things that Papa was telling me last night that I felt like he wanted me to share with you. Yeah. So... <clears throat> He wants to constantly clothe us with power from on high in every season, mantle us with head to toe. The robe that Joseph had was all the way, full sleeves, head to toe robe. So he wants to mantle us with full length, head to toe, multicolored, many dimensional favor. Oh, wow. Amen. That's what the Father has for us. Amen. Head to toe, full length, many dimensional, multicolored favor. That kind of favor is what awakes and unlocks an imagination. And every one of us have an imagination that's inspired by heaven. And that kind of favor, that kind of wrapping and cloaking, look at a couple of people and tell them God's got you covered today. He's the one who speaks. And at times we don't even notice it because we're so distracted or we're so stressed or we're so pain aware of painful circumstances that we're, we're numb to purposeful opportunities. We become aware of the wrong things and the negative things. So sometimes he has to knock us out, put us to sleep, and invade our subconscious and get dreams to us or get a word through to us through, through a song service or through a prophet or, or through a, a, the ministering of the word or however he has to get it through uh, to pull something out of us that will help further define purpose and identity to us. Let me tell you two more situations just real quick, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up on this. In Genesis, God brought every animal to Adam to name them. And it said that all these animals are brought before Adam. And he tells Adam, name them, them. Amen. In every translation I looked at, it was talking about pairs. So here's Adam alone. <laughs> and God is bringing all of these pairs to him. And he is naming them and calling them. And they are what he says they are. But at the end of that... Then the Lord doesn't leave him alone. The Lord turns around and says, it's not good that man be alone. Mm -hmm. So he calls in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. Are you ready for this? Yeah. He caused a deep sleep Amen. to fall on Adam. <laughs> and he slept. And while he was asleep, he opened his side and took one of his ribs. And he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So while he's in a state of deep sleep, he pulled out of him what was needed to complete him. Amen. And that's what he did. What he did with the first Adam in the Garden of Eden was what he did with the last Adam on the cross. Amen. When Jesus went to sleep on the cross, 
they opened this site with the spear and blood and water flowed out. Yeah. And that's the first picture we have of the church being formed or born, taken from the side of Jesus Christ. And so the bride comes from his side. Now I want to make this statement, and this is my last statement I'm making. You are complete in him. Yeah. Know that today, okay? You are complete in Him, but there are still things in you that are released as you become increasingly aware of Him and open to Him on deeper levels. Hallelujah. I'm going to repeat it, okay? You are complete in Him, but there are still things in you that are meant to be drawn out, pulled out, activated, and released from you and that happens as you become increasingly aware of Him and open to Him on deeper levels. Amen. So stand to your feet with me this morning. <laughs> Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your presence. Hallelujah. Just, just kind of lift your hands on worship for just a second. Hallelujah. Just right where you're at, just say, Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence. Thank you for the word. We receive your word with meekness. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your presence right now. I thank you for what you, Papa, have shared with us, for the impartations you've given us today. I thank you for it. Father, I believe we're coming into a season at Grace Center where you're activating gifts, where you're stirring up prophetic purpose and destiny in every one of us. And I emphasize every one of us. Every one of us. It's not just for pastor. It's not just for Pastor Andrew. It's not just for so-and-so. It's not just for the ladies that lead the prayer team. But every one of your sons and daughters can dream dreams. Every one of them can prophesy. Every one of them can heal the sick. Every one of them can have the flow of your spirit moving through their lives. In you, we live and move and have our being. But Father, there is also a moving that comes from us. As you send us into the world, Father, every day, every week, you're manifesting through us so that everywhere we go, people are seeing Christ. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Lord, I just I pray that as the word was released today, Lord, it began to activate and cause a stirring of things deep down on the inside of us. And Father, I just prophesy right now and declare those things continue to stir, continue to be stirred, that they continue to move on the inside of us, that we become increasingly aware of the supernatural realm, increasingly aware of your presence, increasingly aware of your power. Father, I'm convinced, I'm convinced that many times, many times the things that we're craving in our life, the things that we're chasing in our life are things that would be filled in your manifest presence. They are things, Father God, that if we were in intimacy situations with you, these things, these these. these holes would be filled, these differences, these variations, the things that we feel are missing or lacking, we would begin to find a completeness in you, a wholeness and a fullness in you. And Father, I thank you that you're doing supernatural things inside of us, in our hearts and minds, in our lives. You're invading our dreams. You're invading our thoughts. You're invading our homes, our marriages. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, Father. Hallelujah. We thank you, praise. Father, I thank you that this morning you want to share your heart with us, Father God. Father, I thank you that today is the day that you want us to stir up the giftings that you have deposited, deposited within us, Lord. Father, I thank you that today, today is the day, Father God, that you take your bride to a higher level of, of boldness to step out and to stir up the gifts and to use the gifts that you have given us, Father, to bring us, your bride, into a higher place, um, into a deeper area of your heart, that we will be able to even hear your heartbeat, and that in hearing that heartbeat will give us some hope, oh, Father God, that we need to go to that next place, Father God, we just thank you.
Father, as we celebrate this season of giving, this season of love, oneness of you. Father, I just speak over this church, over this family, this family that is represented here, Father, as we recognize that each and every one of us represents a sphere of influence. This is a huge crowd. Father, I just release over each and every one of us the fullness of our identity to realize that we are as one before your eyes. And Father, as one, we rely in and trust in you. But Father, we need one another. We need one another. We need to know that we know that we know that we all have the capability to move and breathe and have our being the highest level. At the highest level, Father. So anyone right now, Father, I just release over this this body right now. The knowledge that you Wednesday night, but there were only about half of this crowd was there Wednesday night. 
I saw a, an old vehicle, an older model vehicle pulled into a car lot and a, and a man came out to, of the store to meet him and he got out of the car and the man that came out of the store said, you're here for your upgrade, aren't you? And he said, yes, I am. And so he said, it's, it's coming, there it is right now, it's coming out of the garage. And they pulled up and got out of a brand new, fully loaded Mercedes Benz. And they took the old car keys and they handed him the new ones and he drove off. And I asked, I've been asking the Lord, what is that? And I felt like what the Lord said is, that is what I'm wanting to do right now with Grace Center. I'm wanting to just upgrade and update everything and take everything to another level, another mode of operation. Now, you know, it's not, and I'm not a fan of Mercedes per se, it's not really that, but there are certain names that when the name is mentioned, there's an excellence of operation that is associated with the name. That's what I get out of Mercedes Benz. So I begin to think that what he's doing, and I think it's very strategic that Pastor Mike and his family is about to join us from uh, Dyersburg as well very strategic that what he's doing is just updating the mode of operation of Grace Center to an excellent, a more excellent updated, upgraded model. You know, and I just say, Lord, so be it unto me according to your word. I need it. Amen. I don't know about you, but I need it. I need it and I, I'm totally surrendered to it. Uh, so, Father, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for family. Thank you for the food that we have today, Father. We just pray that you bless it to strengthen us and nourish our bodies, bless our time of fellowship. So thankful for every member of the Grace Center and what I have seen as a pastor that you're doing in every one of their lives. I love these folks and I love doing life with these folks.